Welcome everyone. And thank you for attending Discrete Batch Processing with Stella. I'm Bob Eberlein and it is a pleasure to be presenting to you today. Um, before we get started with the webinar, I do want to go over a few of the mechanics uh, dealing with GoToWebinar for those of you who have not used it before. When you start GoToWebinar, there will be a uh, window that opens up. It's got a grab tab that enables, allows you to either hide or show that window, which shows up at the uh, the left typically, and then there's an audio setup. If you can't hear me, um, unfortunately, you don't know what I'm saying, but um, you may be able to choose a different microphone. Oh, actually, it's the audio output side that you need to, to see um, for the audio to fix that. And then um, if you have questions anytime during the webinar, we're gonna have a question and answer period at the end, but anytime you have questions during the webinar, if something is wrong, just type it into your question area and uh, we'll have someone look at it. Some of the questions, if they're related to the mechanics of the webinar, we'll probably just answer directly with, uh, with text in the same box. The other ones that we will defer to the end we'll, during the answer and question period, question and answer period. So um, with that, and without further ado, if I can convince my screen to go to full screen mode, uh, we'll get started um, and um, go through the, um, today's topic. So what I wanna talk about today is um, batch processing and discrete models. And we've added a bunch of new features in version 1.9 that helps with that. But what I wanna really do is start a little bit with the background. We're gonna do buckets and batches, the continuous versus discrete representations of systems and how they relate to one another. And I'll start with a simple cycle time example and then move on to attributes, queuing and dispatch, when where work will be done, jumping the queue, um, using attributes to prioritize, dumping the queue, removing older material, material from queues, and then mixing process time and assembly lines, which is a relatively interesting way of combining the new attribute capabilities with matching what's happening inside of an assembly line. And finally, I'll make some summary observations and so we'll have a question and answer period. So I'm gonna be talking about both old and new functionality today, because really the only way to introduce some of the old functionality some of the new functionality is to show you the old functionality and how it works. So we're gonna be covering queues, ovens, and a very, to a very small extent, conveyors today. These are things that have been around for a long time. And as we go through these, we're gonna be showing the new additions to 1.9, attribute tracking, round robin dispatching, process prioritization, purging of old material. So I'm gonna endeavor, endeavor to remark on the things that are new so that you can show out, but to summarize what's new in 1.9, We've added the ability to attach an attribute to a flow so that things that go through a sequence of stocks following that attribute um, will follow that attribute through the sequence of stocks, which is very much like time stamping was used for cycle time. Um, and means we can measure them downstream and cycle time measurements can also be used um, attribute specific. Attributes and timestamps always track. You don't have to turn on cycle time mode anymore. You can use attributes and timestamps and queues and conveyors and ovens, which are always discrete. And if you want to use them on non-negative stocks, you will need to turn on cycle time integration. Um, but we've also made cycle time quite a bit more efficient so that turning on cycle time integration should not have a big impact on the performance of the model anymore. Um, Queue dispatch and control, we can use priorities for destinations and round robin dispatch, which is a way of dispatching to different ovens. We'll show some examples of that. In queuing control, which means that you can jump the queues, put in some, uh, some of the flows or batches of material really coming into a queue can be given a higher priority. And then we'll have queue purging based on time and process, which allows you to get rid of older material, either in a case, case where there are perishables, or if you want to uh, expedite processing for something, which is the way it will be done in the example that I'm gonna show. Um, and then there are some conveyor updates, which I'm not really gonna talk about here, but I did wanna mention they're new in 1.9, which is we have FIFO, um, which is allows the conveyor to act more like a, a physical conveyor belt when transit times change. And there are some new inflow options, which really open up the door for more accurate modeling of immigration, emigration, demographics, and disease progression and transitions and aging chains, which are um, pretty valuable to do. And we will have another webinar scheduled really to go over those uh, topics um, in uh, late summer or early fall. 
So I want to start out by talking about continuous versus discrete. And this is really a conceptual overview of how we think about those two things. So a stock and flow representation is a liquid metaphor, a continuous representation. Stocks are tubs of liquids and flows are taps and drains. Since it's liquid we're talking about, it is infinitely divisible. Well, not truly infinitely, but um, divisible beyond uh, all normal measurement. And each flow is made up of bits that are really not distinguished from one another. Think of water as just a bunch of H2O molecules. We don't care about how they, what any of them looks like. There's just a bunch of them. It's the quantity of them that matters. Um, the stock gets those bits, and as soon as the stock gets a bit of stuff, it all mixes up. So, for example, if you poured hot water into cold water in this flow metaphor, uh, as soon as you pour a little bit of hot water in, the temperature of all of the cooler water will change instantly. Um, and the outflow then is a bit of the stock because the stock is perfectly mixed. Everything that comes out of the stock comes out with exactly the same characteristics as what is in the stock. So that's the continuous flow representation. When we think about things, regardless of how we're modeling, we think about them in batches. And we make that explicit in queues, ovens, and conveyors, where anything that comes in is a batch of material that needs to be processed as a batch. And it tends to be implicit in the way we d view delay processes, where something comes in, stuff will happen to it for a while, and then it'll come out the other end. So the cycle time integration technique allows that interpretation, this batchy interpretation, without making any changes to the diagram. It's really just a different way of thinking about computation. So I'm going to go over and take a look at this batch.stmx model. So um, hopefully I'm in the right directory here. Nope. So let me see. Just get myself into the right directory. This is the wrong model, but I'm in the right directory, so it's life, life will be a little easier for me. Um, and I'll open up batch.stmx. Now, this, ha this model has, these models, by the way, will all be available after the webinar. We'll send out a link to where, so that you can download them if you want to make use of them. Um, this has a continuous representation on the top here where we take aging, uh, we start some mixing. We have a perfect mixing stock. And we're going to let that stock age a little bit, and then I'm going to age out. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a final demand that changes. And when the final demand changes, it's going to go up. So the amount of the age of material in the stocks is going to go down. And then I'm going to use exactly the same conceptual frame for that, but do it with discrete batches. So we start the batches in, we track them, and they flow out. And this model is exactly what you might expect it to be on the inside. All the equations are kind of what you'd expect. Um, and when we run this, what we see what happens, if we look at the average age of the stock, um, it starts out for the continuous part um, as five, and then it goes down very smoothly as the demand, you can see final demand here is increasing. Um, as the demand goes up, it goes down because things are not staying in as long. If we look at the average age of material that is flowing out, as soon as the demand goes up, it starts to go down and it goes down linearly until it reaches a new lower level, which is the same level that the continuous model asymptotes to, but it happens much more quickly. And if we look at the average age of material in the stock, a couple things to notice, it's on a different scale actually. Because the average age of material, when there is not perfect mixing, there's old stuff at this end of the stock, if you will, and young stuff at this end. And the average age is the average across all of those, and it turns out to be about half. It's a little more than half because there's an extra DT involved. Um, but about half of the material, of the age of the material, and as soon as the demand goes up, that average age goes down. It goes down relatively smoothly but it completely finishes its adjustment by the time that the age of the outflow goes down, which if you think about it makes sense. All of the batches that were going through with a longer time before have gone through and everything now is coming through with a shorter time. And so we're in the new steady state. So it adjusts, as much, it adjusts much more quickly to the steady state. So that's kind of the distinction between a batch and a continuous view of the world. And um, there's a variant of that, which allows me to introduce the new concept of adding an attribute to a flow. This model is going to be called attribute.stmx, but it's very similar to the batch model. Um, and the top will be a completely standard coflow structure. So if you watched the molecules webinar um, a month or so ago, 
you will have seen CoFlows introduced there. Um, it's a very standard structure where we keep track of the attributes based on incoming attributes and the way the stock changes. And that again assumes perfect mixing. So there's an average of the outflow is just the average. And then in this model, I put in a bottom stock that uses the attribute feature to push the attribute into the stock, which is treated as a FIFO stock, FIFO queue effectively. And using the cycle time integration method allows us to keep track of how much of that attribute is on what comes out and is what is in the stock. So um, we're going to notice a couple of things when we look at this. The continuous version is much slower to change things. And neither is really right. And I'm going to show you yet another variation of this that uses a um, conveyor to track attributes um, in a similar way. So if we go back to Stella, close this. And then I will open up attribute. And again, this is a continuous section. So looks, this looks very, very similar to the model we just had. It's got a discrete section where material comes in, except in this discrete section now, we just dock the uh, results panel here. We've said that there is an attribute value called new car mileage that is coming into this discrete flow, which is the cars and cohorts. Now the new car mileage is also coming into the co-flow structure to keep track of the average total mileage and thereby the average mile, mileage using the co-flow. But in the case of the cars and cohorts, if we look at the equation for that, we just have some initial value, and then the outflow is the outflow you would expect. It's actually the same as this outflow. Cars over average life, cars and cohorts over average car life. But we can measure the attribute of the um, cars being discarded, the average mileage of cars being discarded, and the average mileage of cars in the cohort. Now remember again that those are the same in the continuous flow, but they're gonna be different in the discrete flow. And if we run this model, what we end up with, new car mileage here is shown in blue, and then the average car using the co-flow is in um, red, and it moves up slowly and adjusts, and towards the end, towards time 60, it's roughly to the new value, but it's taken it a long time to get there. If we look at the mileage of discards, that does nothing for the length of the, the uh, lifetime of the car, which is 10 years. And then it immediately goes up and parallels, exactly parallels the new car mileage coming in. And this is because the things are going out 10 years after they came in. And then if we look at the average in this stock, which is the average using the discrete attribute across the stock, um, it goes up very similar to the way the average did overall in the continuous formulation, but then more quickly. And again, by the time everything in the stock is now coming in at the higher mileage, which is 10 years after this uh, increase finishes, it is at the new higher level and everything is the same there. Now, this is a little bit inaccurate because the way cars age is not they come in and then they all get thrown away. Some get thrown away in the meantime, and you can capture that using a conveyor. And the conveyor is basically, I should probably put this in edit mode so you can see the conveyance symbols on it. We have cars coming in. Those cars still have an attribute new car mileage like we did before, um, and but there's a leakage there, which is an average car life. And then the conveyance time, instead of just being average car life, is twice average car life, recognizing that some of the cars are coming out earlier and destroying cars is the, this is the maximum life effectively. The transit time is the maximum life of a car, as opposed to the average life of a car. And the outflow is the average life of a car um, using early destruction. And in that case, the new car mileage goes up. We see the average using a discrete attribute changes most quickly. The average using a conveyor changes a little less quickly, and the average using a co-flow changes less quickly still. So the conveyor, which is probably the most accurate representation for this particular construct, just looking at the fleet mileage of, ve of vehicles on the road, is um, in between the purely uh, discrete view of the world, where everything comes in in a batch and goes out, and the continuous view of the world, where everything gets mixed up and goes out at the end eventually. So that is attribute tracking um, using that mix. And then um, 
the next thing I want to look at is queuing and dispatch. So I'm going to start with ovens normal, which you may have guessed is something you could have done in previous versions of Stella. Uh, material arrives for processing. Um, it's constants in this model, but uh, typically you'll get some Poisson processor or another uh, other type of uh, stochastic process giving you uh, material generation. It enters a queue. There's a batch that enters the queue each DT. So every time there's a flow into a queue, it's effectively a batch for that DT. And queues are usually FIFO. They are in this example. We'll show an example where they, that FIFO gets overwritten later. Available batches are dispatched to processors. Um, this is the oven element in uh, Stella. That's a processor. And in the model I'll show you, there are 10 processors that can be used. And they have capacities, how long it's going to take to process cook time and the fill time um, attributes. And the next available processor takes the batch. So if something's already processing material, it will not be available. The next one takes the batch. And by default, the first connected target gets top priority. And arrays act like a sequence of elements. So what I want to do is show you this model. And it is process, prioritize, oops, ovens normal, remember the name. And so we've got material coming in, it's waiting, it's starting, and now I have a processing queue. And if we look at the array of that, it's arrayed by dimension one. I didn't change the name of the array element. Um, and each of those um, ovens in this case completes uh, material processing and we can look at an average utilization. So this is the typical, um, um, typical setup that we could have done in the earlier versions of Stella. And if we run this, what happens is um, the average time out of all processing is two. There's no waiting. There's enough um, capacity in these uh, ovens that manage everything. And the first eight ovens are used completely. And the 9, 10, 11, and 12, the last four ovens are not used at all. And this um, using this use of the, the array elements here is exactly the same. Let me just show you this thing as non-arrayed. Um, we get eight ovens that are being used and being utilized, showing the utilization there, and four ovens that are not. And rather than having them all show up as a single element that's arrayed, we have them showing up as 12 separate um, numbering is a little wrong there, 12 separate ovens. Um, but the, the logic is exactly the same. I can go to this waiting and say, wait a minute, I'm using only the first eight ovens. It would make sense that if I have like these ovens, I just round robin so that we don't wear the ovens out, so to speak. So I can um, use dispatch priorities and round robin selection. The dispatch priority is um, can be set. Um, as a dispatch priority zero, um, and which means they're all the same. And if I do that, what happens is we spread out the um, utilization over all of the ovens. I'm going to need to hide that. I'll just close it for the moment. We spread out the utilization over all of the ovens. They get about 68% or whatever it is of the capacity. And we can do exactly the same thing in the um, non-arrayed version, we can use dispatch and priorities, run it, it gets spread out over all the ovens and you can see all the ovens are in use. So that's kind of nice because it allows us just to use round robin processing. Um, the first connected target gets the top priority until you use round robin, that's true only in the first time and then it round robin between all the connected targets. So arrays act like a sequence of elements of the array. Um, it really is the same thing as the blown out model with no arrays. It's just that it doesn't show up that way visually. But we can also prioritize the um, dispatch. So this is a new feature in version 1.9. Um, as is the round robin is the new feature in version 1.9. And it specifies which processor is considered next, which are, where a smaller number has a higher priority. So there's the first processor, the second processor, the third processor, and so on. So ordering is ordinal, but values need not be integers. And actually, I'll show you how this makes sense with this example. And ovens are the most common recipient of uh, this kind of dispatch logic, although you could use a capacity constrained conveyor in the same way um, to get the same effect. 
uh, although typically it's, it's ovens that are being used here. And filling ovens are given precedence. One thing that happens is when, once an oven starts filling, actually in the examples I'm gonna give you, there won't be any ovens that are filling it, but won't completely fill. But once an oven starts filling, if it's waiting for more material, it's given first priority. Um, and if there's more than one oven waiting for a material, which is pretty rare actually, the priority um, is based upon the specified priority for the oven, which we'll see in a second. So, and um, if you've got ovens that are of the same priority, then we use round robin within those ovens. So I'm gonna go to that model. And it's a, similar setup in terms of the physics of the situation. I didn't blow out the uh, the non-arrayed version of it, but each of these startings has now got a dispatch priority that's called priority. And the priority equation is a little bit funny because I put in this continuous switch, but um, let's just focus on the second part of the, the else part here. So if target utilization is bigger than the average utilization, then we give it a priority of one, which is to say it's the first priority. Otherwise we give it a priority of two, it's the second priority. It'll have a lower, it, it, it's, it's second. It doesn't get things as quickly. And if I, I set up these target utilizations as a bunch of numbers, I said it's one for the first, then it's a bunch of 0.8s and some 0.4s mixed in. And if I run this, I get something that looks like this. I get 0.8 for almost everybody, and then I get 0.4, roughly 0.4, um, exactly 0.4, 0.79, very close to 0.8, and 0.4 for everyone else. And you say, wait a minute, target utilization for the first element, and again, if you um, haven't used uh, Stella Live in a bit, when you have an arrayed constant and you're using Stella Live, the arrayed element is the one that would be shown if you were example to look at the results panel. Uh, actually, if you just hover over it, it'll tell you, maybe if you hover over it, it will tell you which one it is. So it's target utilization one. So it's working on the first element. And if I change that, that will change. This is one. If I make it less than 0.8, it goes down. But if I make it more than 0.8, it doesn't go down. Why is that? Well, it's because we have this priority that is either a one or a two, and we don't quite have enough material coming into this to make it one. If we had a little bit more material coming in, then we would get closer to our one, but we don't have enough material Every, all these 0.8 ovens are looking for a little bit more. None of them get it. So they're all giving the same basis for not getting it. We could use a continuous switch, which going back to the equation said, if the continuous switch, then we use um, one minus safe div of the average utilization um, with a value of 10 if the average utilization is zero. And this means that we will now break up the target utilizations um, separately for all the different values. And with this form, going back to live, if I turn on the continuous switch, then the target utilization of the first is one, and we get real granularity here. As we go down, we can get it down, and we can take it down well below the 0.4 to almost zero. And this is a case where the ordering or the priority given for dispatch to the different ovens is based upon an ordinal ranking of that, but the ordinal ranking is based upon a continuous operation. So the value, um, just for simplicity, that's not exactly what the equation would give, but let's say this value gave 0.18, the other one is giving 0 0.32. 0 0.18 is less than 0.32, so it could have been one and 20 or one and two. All that matters is the sequence of orderings, one, 0 0.18, 0 0.25, 0 0.34, and so on, not the actual numeric values that determines which dispatch will occur into the prior processing queue. Um, pro in processing ovens coming out of the queue. And so that gives us average utilizations that's much more controllable using this continuous switch. So that's how we can prioritize ovens, um, the outflows from a queue. And the other thing we can do is we can prioritize the inflow coming into a queue. And what this does, is it allows some batches to skip to the front of the line. Think of it as queue jumping if you're uh, 
used to that concept, or in the middle, because what we do is we say what, um, how they will weight relative to other elements that might already be in the queue. And again, this is a ordinal ranking system. It's something that's new in 1.9. And when you do this, the queue no longer becomes, it's no longer a FIFO queue because what we're doing is we're allowing material to come in earlier or jump in front of material that has already been in the queue for some time and therefore it will come out earlier. This uses the attribute value to manage the skipping. So where we had attribute value before, we're gonna take the attribute value and use that to specify where it gets in terms of prioritization of going onto the queue, which means the attribute has a slightly different meaning. Um, this attribute value does carry through, and we'll see in the example that both prepping and baking have this queue jumping characteristic, although in the example I'm giving you, um, prepping tends to be the constraint, whereas baking is not so much. And um, make a model comment actually after I come back to the slides. So this is prioritized processing. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna have orders come in, regular orders or rush orders. Regular orders have an attribute value of two, which is a second priority, if you will, for the um, queue. And then rush orders have an attribute value of one. When they come in and go through prep, there are a number of prep stations, I think it's five in this case. Um, uh, four in this case, um, when they come into prep, anything coming in through this rush channel is going to be faster. And we're using a Poisson distribution uh, for the rush channel um, in order to emulate the uh, um, non-deterministic nature of the order process. And once it goes through in prep, finishing process, again, we don't reset the attribute value, so it carries through from what it originally was. And so the oven will also use um, prioritized inflows based on attribute values. And this oven, oops, the, um, the first queue, excuse me, will also prioritize values based on, uh, inflows based on attribute values. And if we run this model, what happens is the uh, rush people are always put at the head of the queue they get through, they always get an average time of just over 20 minutes, um, which is how long it takes 15 minutes to cook and five minutes to prep. So they're talking about just an extra minute of waiting. Whereas these poor people who are just the regular guys end up having to wait a long, long time because they're getting pushed behind the line and um, there's not quite enough capacity to satisfy all of them and they end up waiting for quite some time. So you might say, well, that's not so good. It's okay to treat them a little bit badly, but we shouldn't treat them so badly. Perhaps what we could do is we could put in a um, something around prep, and that takes us kind of to the next concept here. Um, but I did want to make one comment on the model before we move on to that. Um, in this model, we ignore shelving, which is say it goes from prep to another queue, which has infinite capacity theoretically, and um, but we could have a, uh, a staging transition, a stock or an oven or a conveyor or something that actually deals with the fact that you've got a limited amount of shelving, which might limit the overall capacity. So orders would come in and they would pile up as back orders effectively. They would not be put in for processing immediately because there'd be no place to, to get them started. But what we can do with um, this idea that, well, let's not treat our regular customers quite so badly by purging older material, is when material gets too old, we may decide to remove it from the queue. Um, spoilage if it's a perishable, but in the case that we're gonna be working here, expedited processing, if things are simply taking too long in order to execute the, the run. So this is done by purging the queue based on cycle time. So the timestamp upstream from the queue is used to figure out how long something has been in the queue. And the material can be discarded, or in the case, this case, we're actually gonna um, take the material and put it into another processing chain. Um, and purge flows do not process. Purging is pretty flexible. I'm gonna show you an example of that in a moment, but first let's go through the purging version of the pizza store. And that is purging processing two. So we say 
we're going to expedite, and that says purge after age, expediting time. So this is the age after which we're going to purge. It's going to go into a reprocessing of orders. It's going to be a reassigned with a new timestamp, and then we're going to go through the system. And because it's got a new timestamp when it's reassigned, um, we're going to have to add something to it to figure out how long it's taking on average to uh, go through the um, regular times. But if we do this, this beginning is exactly the same as we started because we're not doing any expediting. But if I bring this expediting time down to a smaller number, it's interesting and embarrassing. Okay, hang on just a second. So as I bring this processing down to a, um, a shorter time, is that interesting and embarrassing. Um, you're gonna have to take my word for it, unfortunately. Um, so material gets too old, it gets removed, and we can purge material for that. And then um, I wanted to show you a way in which purging is um, quite flexible. Um, not this one actually, but this model, which um, this is a three different ways basically doing conveyors in this case. So there's a traditional conveyor, which is just a standard transit time. There's a conveyor that uses the standard transit time in FIFO. And then there's a purge based, which isn't really a conveyor at all. It's just a queue um, with the purge where the purging occurs when um, material in the queue gets older than the transit time. And so if we run this model, we see what happens is for the traditional queue, as soon as the transit time, the transit time here is going um, up, then so going, going down and then going back up to where it started. When we um, decrease the transit time, a traditional outflow does absolutely nothing until we hit material that came in in the decreased transit time. Then we combine that with the material that was in the original transit time. And then we go back to the steady state. And similarly, when the transit time goes up, nothing happens until we run out of material at the old transit time. Then there's a gap where we get zero output. And then we get the material that's coming in at the old transit time. With a FIFO queue, what's happening is the uh, material comes out a little bit more quickly when the transit time goes down and comes out a little bit more slowly when it goes up and it goes back to normal. And with our purging queue, what happens is as soon as we change the transit time, we dump a whole bunch of material out to get rid of everything that's old. And then as soon as it's longer, we just hold on to everything. We don't let anything go at all until it's old enough. And then we return back to sending stuff out after its specific age. So the purge is a fairly flexible way of dealing thing with things It can do both um, uh, as I say, material that might be considered uh, perishable and can also be used to, to uh, expedite processing. Um, and finally, I want to show an example of mixing process times. And this is a, a way to manage different characteristics. We're going to use arrays to do this, where the elements, um, arrays can be used in general for this, but elements and arrays never mix. And so if we're looking at a system where there's a constraint where things have to go through a common resource, we're going to use that by starting with arrays and then collapsing those arrays. Um, the trouble with just arrays is once they're merged, they can't be recovered. But by using the array element as an attribute, we can recover the array, um, which array element it was by using the attribute count or similar or cycle time function. I'll show you a couple of different ways of doing that um, to look at how much of the material we've got. So we can array a queue by type and then mix during dispatch. That'll be my first example. And to array a queue by type, Uh, which is um, mixed processing array queue. Uh, what happens here is we have new starts coming in. These are arrayed by type, where type is um, 
type is simple, medium, and hard, and then there are just 10 workstations that can process the, the material. So simple, medium, and hard come in, simple, medium, and hard are waiting, they get started, and then they go off to a workstation. The workstation is arrayed by a workstation. Waiting is arrayed by type. That makes the starting arrayed by type and workstation. It's dispatching from a particular type that is waiting to a particular workstation. And we wanna know how long that workstation is gonna to need to work. So it's got the work time of starting, how long, how, the amount of time it will need to work. And that is the following. Um, and this relies on the fact that we only ever dispatch a single batch at a time because um, this model is not set up to split batches and the batch size is appropriate for an oven. So we just sum across whether or not something is starting. If it is starting, then we use a process time of the type that is starting. Otherwise we use zero. So we're gonna add a couple zeros to, plus the process time of the thing that actually is starting. And then we get to finish and we get to see how long things spend. So we do that, we see that the simple things take about two. Um, medium things take about two, sorry, the simple things take about one hour to process, the medium take about two hours, and the hard things take about three hours. There's a little bit of variation there, but not a lot. Um, this system is capable of processing its output. Um, but if we increase the load on the system, what happens is kind of interesting. You'll see that um, we get some variation in the simple and the medium, but we get a lot of variation in the hard, and towards the end, the hard keeps growing and growing and growing. So you might say, why is that? Well, let's turn on round robin for waiting here. Use dispatch and round robin selection. Do you think that will fix things? By default, one might think yes, but in fact, it makes no difference at all. Round robin dispatching determines which workstations are using things. I haven't changed priorities here in any way, but they do not have any impact on the total number of workstations capable of processing things. It doesn't actually make any difference to uh, this realized process time in any significant way. And what's happening here is we don't have one queue here, we have three queues here, a simple queue, a medium queue, and a difficult queue. And the the simple queue is processed first, it's thing material is dispatched, then the medium queue is processed, it's material is dispatched, and then the difficult queue is processed, it's material is dispatched. Well, since it's processed last, the ovens have already gotten their fill from simple and medium, so it's much, mess, much less likely that one of these uh, complicated uh, things was gonna get into the workstation. And you may think that is not fair, and indeed that is not fair. What we'd like to do is we'd like to treat the simple, easy, and difficult tasks all similarly. And in order to do that, we go to the second thing where we consolidate all of the inflow into a single queue, which is mixed processing single queue. And what happens to do, the way to do this is actually cascade two queues, one right after the other. So this is simple processing, single queue. So what we've got is the sorting queue, which is used to be called the waiting queue, which is the same. Now the array characteristics of an inflow are determined by the stock. You can't set these separately. So we have a stock that is arrayed in this case by type. And then that goes through getting ready into a waiting queue, which is not arrayed at all. So everything gets lumped into this single arrayed queue, and then we start from this arrayed queue, and now starting instead of being by both type and workstation is only by workstation, which means we need to use a slightly different way to figure out the time that it's gonna to take to process things at a workstation. So this is process time starting, and the process time starting is the maximum of the process time starting by type, where the process time starting by type is if the starting, we're starting at a workstation for the given type, I'm using the ATTR count function here, which counts the number of elements, that, the number of batches that have an attribute of this type. It's a count on a flow. So typically it's gonna either return a one or a zero. Um, although in this case, we're dispatched to a bunch of ovens, so it could actually return um, uh, more than that in terms there could be more than one batch involved there. Um, Actually, there's only for one, no. So we're only gonna be dispatching one thing at a time to an oven, so this is either gonna return a zero or a one, what I said in the first place was true. Um, and then, um, so if it returns a one, then we figure out the processing time by type, 
So this attribute count is specifying which type of attribute to look for. One is simple, two is medium, three is hard, but we're just using type here. Otherwise, it simply returns zero. And here, if we just run this, we get exactly the same behavior we saw before. I'm not sure if it's exactly exactly, but very much the same. However, now if we take the mean starts and we rise that, what happens is all of the different types end up taking more time. So they're put on an equal footing. Once they go into this waiting queue, it's a, um, a scalar queue. So everything that's waiting comes out and goes into starting. And as a consequence, since it's a scalar queue, all of the different types are given equal chance to go in and get processed. They're not given preferential treatment based upon the, the uh, array characteristics of the queue. So no preference by type when the system is capacity constrained. So that's missing, mixing process times. So um, some observations on discrete stocks. This is obviously a very quick introduction to all of this. There's a fair bit of documentation on discrete stocks. If you look at the release notes for version 1.9.1 um, and the help files, you'll see that there's a fair bit there. Discrete elements can be used to add fidelity to any model. With perfect mixing is not the appropriate thing to be looking at when you're um, working with the model. And with the release of version 1.9 and 1.91, it is easier to mix and match discrete and continuous elements. Cycle time and attribute tracking can be um, used anywhere. Um, so there's a little, and it's also a little performance penalty, penalty oops, sorry, for just turning on cycle time um, because we now look at which um, stocks in the model actually need to be tracking things more closely. When we turn on cycle time, a non-negative stock becomes a, uh, a queue effectively. And because it's a queue, there's a lot more computation involved, but we only do that when it is necessary now. So it doesn't hurt us if you have parts of the model that are not using um, cycle time or attribute tracking. Um, and we can control material paths much more completely. Um, so mapping and the array definitions give the physical layout. That's what's always been there. But now we can prioritize queue out queue inflows to determine which things end up on the queue first. We can manage the queue dispatch to determine which ovens typically, or it could be conveyors, get the things out of the queue first, and we can purge queues based upon age. Um, one thing that's important to remember here is batches are still monolithic. Um, a batch is composed of one set of material, one set of cars with a specific gas mileage, for example, in the uh, gas mileage thing. They're not composed of um, 25 different types of cars or 20 or 20,000 different cars, each with its own gas mileage. You can use arrays to break that down and get more, um, uh, more fidelity uh, around what kind of things are happening there. Um, but arrays do introduce their own complexities, um, as you, you can imagine. So um, it's important to keep in mind uh, the nature of the batches. So what I'd like to do now is open it up for questions. Um, there's more information on um, this basically in the help files, um, if you go to that link. And um, we have an upcoming webinar in aging and disease progression using um, conveyors. And then there's also an upcoming webinar in using Stella to trace causality, um, times to be determined. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to questions um, that anyone might have. And Kareem will be reading the questions off. Hey, Bob, uh, great presentation. On the last example that you gave, um, did you um, set the attribute to be the type when it came in so that you could break them apart in the queue? Thank you. Yes, I went over that a little too quickly, uh, possibly. Um, so the new starts by type, the attribute value is given the uh, array element type. Now, some of you may not have used this before, but if you have something that is arrayed, as this is by type, you can type in the name of the array and it will have, take on the values for the array elements where the first one is one, the second one is two and so on. So we have one, two, and three as the attribute values here. And when we are doing things like measurize, measuring the process time, what we use is we use the CT mean function. We're finishing is what we're taking the mean of. Zero is the um, initial value. And type is the attribute that we want to filter for. So you can filter all of the, the cycle time functions down to look at a specific attribute um, using type. You can also do an attribute range using two values, but in this case, it made sense to use just the, the single value. Great, thank you. The next question is, is cycle time 
is the integration method user controlled and is it global or local? So the cycle time integration method uses Euler integration for everything that does not retire, not require cycle time computation. It is a global setting. Um, but the things that don't require cycle time computation are actually computed just using standard Euler integration. Those that have timestamps coming into them, uh, into the chains, are going to use the cycle time computation in which we take non-negative stocks and turn them into um, queues so that you can track material as if it is batched. Thank you, but um, now that you're saying about non-negative uh, stocks being queues, what happens if there's a buy flow? Anything that has a buy flow in it will not be turned into a queue and you cannot track cycle time information through it. And the reason for that is it only makes sense to be able to track um, batch material if batch material is coming in and going out. If you got material that may be coming in or going out, it's not going to be batchable anymore because there's no way to, to figure out what to do with the material on the edge that is both coming in and going out at the same time. Great, thank you. Uh, we're still waiting for qu other questions from the audience. Um, there were a lot of deep subjects here. Um, I'm sure some will come in. While we're waiting, maybe um, you can explain some application areas for those who aren't familiar with the discrete um, things. You did give a couple, but maybe there are some uh, more obvious things that will make sense okay. to them. So the discrete um, characteristics are usually look, used for anything that's a process flow moving through a system. So there would be people moving through a emergency room or uh, material coming in for processing. Anytime that things have to go through a series where they might be waiting. I mean, the most common discrete element, in all honesty, is the uh, conveyor, which is basically just a delay process that allows you to put some, uh, some leakage on it, and that can be used almost anywhere. The ovens and queues tend to be used more in situations where you have material going in, and the queues are very important where it has to wait for a while. So you might think of a a emergency room where there is a nurse's station for triage. So people come in, they wait in the emergency room, they go to a triage station, they come out of the triage station, they go into another, back into the same waiting room physically, but it will be another queue in a model where there are triage people who are now waiting treatment. And then those people could be given treatment priority based upon the triage determination. And they would go off to uh, another, um, workstation, it's an oven element, which would effectively be a treatment room um, where they would be attended to by um, medical staff to, to order to treat them, or there might be a path by which they would end up going into being uh, admitted to the hospital. Um, and uh, other examples would be for material processing where you're going mixing chemicals and you've got a oven that's used to uh, incubate them for a period of time. It may, may actually be used to bake them um, before something turns out. So they're going to get put in reservoirs waiting. Um, actually, there'll be queues where waiting material to be processed. It's available. Um, it will be processed and then sent out as, a, uh, as an outflow. Um, so there are lots of situations where the discrete uh, characteristics, the discrete the modeling capabilities installed can be very helpful in presenting um, material. Thank you. Um, speaking of mixing, in your early description of mixing as in hot and cold water, is the mix assumed to be instantaneous? Can the time of the mix be controlled? So in a continuous representation, the mixing is indeed instantaneous. You can go and represent, if you're looking at something like actually temperature change in water, you could have a cascaded sequence of stocks, very much like an aging chain that would let you look at the, uh, the change in water temperature as the mixing occurs, and you could break it up that way. But if there is a single stock with hot, hot and cold water coming in, as soon as that water hits the stock, the entire stock is exactly the same temperature as its average would eventually be, given the, the laws of thermodynamics and no other heat exchange. Thank you. Um, how many attributes per queue are available? <laughs> 
So there's only one attribute that can be uh, attached. It is attached to the flows. So depending on how many flows there are into a queue, that's how many attributes there are. In this case, we have three types. So effectively, there are kind of three different value that attribute can take on for a given batch. But there is only a single attribute um, that is held by things. Although, as this example shows, you can use an array element as the attribute. And since it's possible to then recover the array element when you're looking at outflows, you can determine other attributes by arraying those attributes. Thank you. Um, the question that's come up three times already is, will the recording be available after the webinar? Yes, yeah, so the recording will be available after the webinar, as will the models that we use to uh, to make the webinar. So you'll be able to play with them, follow along to the extent that you want to do that, and kind of experiment with these. Now, I do have to say, a lot of the models, especially this last one I showed, have a lot of um, kind of interesting formulations that may be difficult to grasp at first. If you have questions about those, do feel please feel free to shoot us an email and ask us why it's done the way it's done. Um, this is um, extracting attributes is a little bit different from regular physics where you're just kind of counting things and looking at how they go through. You've got to be a little bit um, behind the scenes in terms of what's in there to figure out exactly what's going on. Thank you. I think that's it. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for attending. Uh, appreciate the... Um, um, the attention that you paid. Again, if you have questions, feel free, please feel free to either contact support at icsystems.com or you can just shoot me an email directly if you want, be ever line at icsystems.com. I'm happy to answer questions related to, uh, to, to the material that was presented here. Um, so um, thank you and uh, look forward to seeing you in, an, in another webinar in the future.